Thank you. Um, can you hear me all right that way? Does that work? Okay. Okay, success. Great. Um, okay, it's interesting to me the title under which Marley and I are speaking today, uh, specifically what was the post-internet. Um, and that I guess that tense is most interesting because in a way this term, the post-internet, is more popular than it ever has been before, while at the same time uh, myself and a number of other artists um, who have been at times identified with it are um, kind of coming to a point where we are either kind of running from it or redefining it in a strange way. And I thought I should uh, speak to that really briefly before I begin. Um, part of... Oh. Oh. Is this better? Okay. Okay, this should, this should be better probably. Um, I'm, I guess I'm too tall for this standing mic. Um, anyway, so um, as was mentioned, I wrote this essay in 2010 called The Image Object Post-Internet. Um, this is before I started my series, The Image Objects. Um, and it was seeking to, this is the essay, um, and it was seeking to kind of help to define what at that time was um, kind of a nascent thing where we had um, a number of young artists I was in discussion with had kind of felt like we were moving on from um, a lot of the types of work um, that had been made in kind of uh, the 90s and the early 2000s um, and we're starting to kind of focus on a lot of different types of um, hybrid forms, I guess. And uh, as was mentioned also, treating uh, not just the internet um, as something that was now something uh, less of a novelty and more of a banality, but also um, contemporary um, modes and technologies of image production, things like Photoshop um, being very kind of uh, common, um, common techniques, uh, again, no longer novel and more banal. Um, and part of the reason I think that I say, um, if you could hear me before when this was maybe not working, that uh, the term has been, it's more popular than ever before, but partially I think uh, people are withdrawing from it for fear of um, there maybe not being a necessity for a neologism like it. Um, maybe there isn't a necessity to label something as di like digital art or net art either, uh, or maybe w there wasn't that necessity. Um, and similarly, maybe um, even, so Hito Styral, who was just mentioned um, very early at the beginning of the day, um, also just recently termed, uh, coined the term circulationism, which might also be kind of unnecessary. I think I and a few others, um, some of my peers in New York, for example, um, might think, for example, that uh, the, the truism that Willem de Kooning once said about um, abstract expressionism is maybe true, that to label ourselves um, will be disastrous. So anyway, that's kind of a preamble. Um, I wanted to, let's see, whoop. Where did this go? Okay, here we go. Um, I wanted to start with some work that I created before I wrote this essay. Um, in the essay, I talk about the kind of state, the contemporary state of media in which um, today we um, inhabit a space in which um, anything can conceivably, or everything can conceivably be anything else, where you can take kind of any form of media and turn it into another, and things can be very free form like this. In fact, there doesn't necessarily have to be such a thing as medium specificity anymore. Um, and so around this time that I was uh, starting to compose this essay in 2010, I was doing a lot of these styrofoam sculptures, um, which were um, individually cut um, sheets of styrofoam um, laid out and compressed together to form um, essentially sculptural renderings of videos. And the way that I was doing this was by taking 
um, individual image histograms. Here's an example of that. These are really simple histograms, though, um, that chart the kind of light and dark information within an image. Um, and then taking pieces of video, chopping them down frame by frame, and ordering them. Um, whoop. Um, ordering them from, say, first frame to last frame. So this one on the right here, um, for example, is kind of a play with auto exposure in the camera. Um, and this was an early kind of exploration of mine, trying to figure out a way um, to play off of that lack of medium specificity, trying to find a way to make something that could be, like I said, kind of a hybrid form or something that wouldn't have to necessarily just be um, a sculpture or just be a video, or maybe something that would be a video but not recognizably so. Um, along this line, I also created um, this series called Untitled Photographs. This was more of a semantic play. Um, this was also in 2010, uh, and these untitled photographs are um, actually very short video loops um, that would just play uh, off of projectors in this space and be restricted to a very specific set of dimensions. So for example, the one on the left um, is titled Untitled 40 by 80 inch blue photograph trapezoid. And that means that essentially when this is displayed, it has to be projected at those dimensions um, and as a trapezoid. So this is like very simple, but, um, and I've kind of, I kind of moved quickly away from that. Um, but shows the kind of semantic play and the interest that I had in this idea of material at the time. Let's see. Um, around the same time, uh, I and a number of other, of other peers of mine started experimenting with um, alternate, um, alternate methods of exhibition, which, uh, rather than simply kind of being online platforms or um, just internet-based exhibitions, kind of harkened back in a way to physical space. Um, so this was called an immaterial survey of our peers, for example. This was curated by Brad Trammell and Lauren Christensen of The Jogging. Um, and in this, essentially, they got, um, I think, something like 60 artists internationally to send a bunch of um, images of their work to them which were then photoshopped into an exhibition space. Um, you can see here a short video rendering of that, actually. So this is around um, 2010. And um, shaped in some ways um, w how I thought I wanted to maybe proceed forward. There was also around that same time this thing called Crystal Gallery that uh, Timur Sichin, I don't know if I pronounced that right, sorry Timur, um, did in roughly in Berlin but mostly online. Um, this was a fully 3D rendered um, exhibition consisting of works that were essentially propositional. Um, so I became really interested in uh, figuring out a way in which I could create an object that would somehow uh, cross the divide between both being um, what, for lack of a better word, you could call immaterial and um, having a material presence. And what I started to do um, was this series called The Image Objects. This is the first one that I made, actually, which I didn't call an image object at the time. Um, but uh, this is kind of what this looks like in real life, essentially. This is a print um, directly onto a substrate that is then cut um, around the corners. And then uh, this is kind of just for example's sake. Um, and then when, uh, when disseminated, whether through um, a photograph in a print, for example, or online, um, the image is altered in some way that uh, suggests a new kind of uh, kind of possibility for what the image could be. It gives it, um, it makes it so that kind of one piece, one material manifestation of a work 
can go on to, through the documentation, have um, a number of different lives. So these are some examples of some more recent uh, image object installation views. I don't know if you can see that very well, the projectors. I always have kind of like a problem with the contrast on projectors on this. Um, that's probably a good example. And what I was concerned with here too is um, ending that divide between the kind of uh, primary viewing experience of work and the secondary viewing experience of the work. Um, so whereas we're always so, um, we're so kind of conditioned to um, thinking of the primary viewing experience of the work um, being going into a gallery space and seeing it, interacting with it, walking around it, um, there's no reason necessarily that the um, the images that we see online, whether they al whether I alter them to make this point or not, whether they're, for instance, something we look at on contemporary art daily, whether why that doesn't have to be also a primary viewing experience of the work. Let's see. Um, so key to this, this is for Ben, but I don't think Ben is in the audience, sadly. Um, key to this kind of uh, experience of um, the image objects is their own dissemination, their own circulation. Um, so not only do essentially every time I uh, photograph these objects, I will, uh, I will alter them and kind of uh, post different versions of them all around the internet. Um, I also will collect things like this when uh, someone takes a cell phone photo of them. Um, in the wild or in other cases like this when someone actually kind of does my job for me. So this is something that I think is um, really interesting about these two. They've kind of provoked this, um, this wide cycle of derivative works. Um, derivative sounds so bad, but that's um, how to put it. I don't mean that in any negative connotation whatsoever. Um, so this is a piece by Jeff Bai called Bootleg Image Objects. This is from the first time I ever showed the image objects um, in a gallery in Los Angeles. And um, what he did, I had kind of posted one, he had seen some around, um, some images around. So he took uh, cell phone photos of the works and actually um, kind of photoshopped them in my style and posted them online before I had actually had the chance to post my um, kind of official documentation. This is Party Vierkant. Um, I still don't know who the author is of this. Um, I love it though. Uh, Partyvierkant.tumblr.com. There's only one image, but there's no reason not to follow it. Um, let's see. Whoop. That's too early. And then just to show a couple others, this was shown, I was showing this at the kind of the beginning, but um, this is a derivative copy by uh, Aaron Graham that's called FedEx Kinko's Image Object, E-Trade Image Object. Um, this is by Justin Kelly in Baltimore, Alexis, Texas, Image Object Interface Spirituality Room, The Image Object of My Desire by Joshua Citarella. This part of your camp. Let's see. Someone labeled this an image object and posted it. Flattened image object. Um, and this also is an image that I didn't author. So this is something that I think is interesting too, that um, in this way, the image objects I kind of also created, part of the reason they're um, these gradients and they're overlapping and they have this very specific um, color design to them is that I was very aware that in a certain way I was creating uh, a recognizable iconography that could exist in many altered instantiations. Um, and so to see these kind of be taken up and um, altered by different people, um, making their kind of own, in some cases, bizarre versions of these um, has been really interesting. I don't have a title for this one. No title was provided, I should say. Okay. 
How am I on time? Oh, great, perfect, cool. Um, good, because, so for a long time, um, I worked on the image objects. Part of the series is that uh, they can be kind of endlessly iterated in a way. Um, they can exist in as many instantiations as possible and then I can, from each individual kind of physical object, uh, infinite other uh, images or documentation possibly can exist. Um, part of my interest in that was have, was this, of course, distinction between what we call immaterial and the material. Um, but then, of course, um, at the same time, part of what uh, labels the image object uh, as a kind of immaterial type of work is um, that they mostly s um, circulate as JPEGs. This doesn't necessarily make them very immaterial, though. Um, these things, of course, have to travel um, not only through um, wired networks and things like this, um, but also have to be displayed on very expensive technology. Um, at least the, the um, circulated JPEGs do, for instance. Requires quite a lot of electricity, and you can't really say that these, uh, these things, any digital material really at all, in fact, um, are um, immaterial. Um, so I started thinking a lot about this divide itself. What constitutes um, something that is material and something that is immaterial? Um, the kind of classic philosophical um, way that we can measure this, of course, is the actual and the virtual, which I think um, doesn't bear getting too far into necessarily, um, but led to kind of the subject of this latest series that I'm gonna talk about, um, which is the exploits. Um, I started the exploits this year. I um, first unveiled them in September uh, at a solo show at New Gallery in Paris. Um, and the purpose behind the exploits is essentially um, to look at the purchase or licensing of intellectual property as a way of kind of gathering material for an artwork. Um, so what that means in a kind of practical sense is that what I'll do and what I did for kind of the first exhibition of these works um, was to license two patents, um, a patent just being kind of one variety of intellectual property, um, and use that as the kind of basis on which I could uh, produce these objects to very literally take um, this thing, a patent, an a piece of intellectual property which is carved out as a territory that only one individual or company can um, uniquely exploit, as the legal term, um, can legally take advantage of, um, and to um, to use that to use that kind of model um, as the method for producing work. So, let's see if I can find. Well, here. Um, so this this piece, for example, um, this is a sculpture, or I guess a wall sculpture, a wall work, um, called detach Detachable Storage Rack um, for a Metallic Structure. Um, I forget the number of this one. Um, but this is based off of a patent that I licensed from an individual who lives in Key Largo, Florida, named Rex Rothing, um, who currently uses this patent, which is called Detachable Storage Rack for a Metallic Structure. Um, to sell these kind of small, oops, small refrigerator spice racks. Here, that's him right there. Um, and what's interesting about this is that um, this individual, of course, has uh, has filed this patent. He has secured this intellectual property for himself, um, but in doing so, he hasn't made. Um, a very you know specific patent explicitly stating this is a wooden shelf with magnets in it that goes uh, onto refrigerators and can hold these types of objects. Um, a patent or any kind of intellectual property when you 
try to, again, literally secure that territory. What you're trying to do is also make it as open or vague as possible um, so that it can be kind of broadly interpreted and you can have the fullest legal jurisdiction um, to uh, stop anyone from making what you could consider derivative works um, or uh, making money off of your patent, essentially. So, um, in fact, these um, these uh, spice racks, for example, are functionally, or at least at the level of this uh, piece of intellectual property, one and the same. Um, so what's going on here is you have a shelf with magnets embedded into it that is attached to a kind of metallic structure. Um, it can be kind of any kind uh, and any shape, any metal, as long as those kind of basic um, formats are followed. Um, similarly, uh, this piece, which is called Air Filter and Method of Constructing Same Six, um, is one piece composed of uh, six different window screens um, based on a patent called Air Filter and Method of Constructing Same, which is a patent for uh, the construction of window screens with an additional layer of organza fabric um, embedded within the screen alongside the mesh. So typically these window screens you use to keep out bugs. Um, allegedly the organza also blocks out um, pollens, allergens, um, and 95% uh, of UV ray light. Um, this individual is a man named George Love. He lives in Baltimore. Um, I had some very nice phone conversations with him lining up to the contract that we signed together. Um, but this is how I found him. I found him on YouTube. Um, and I want to show you the way that he presents his invention. Hello, my name is George Love. I'm owner and inventor of Screen Air. Screen Air is a new revolutionary window screen I invented. You just open it up, put it in your window, side to side, put the window down on top of it, breathe, breathe clean screen air. Screen air blocks out pollen, ragweed, dust, mice, insects, and other various types of allergens in the air you breathe in each and every day. It helps people with allergies um, so you can breathe in clean air. It blocks out UV ray light. Here's a light. My screen blocks out UV ray light up to 95% of it. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, this is his kind of product demonstration for his invention for the air filter and method of constructing same patent. He also trademarked um, screen air, which I did not um, license from him. Um, but something that was interesting about this whole process was that, in fact, there is no, for things like this, for um, intellectual property, maybe for um, trademarks and for some, in some cases for copyrights for pieces of music, there's no kind of central exchange. Um, a lot of these things are done relatively informally on places like eBay, um, or m even more likely, um, strange kind of inventor websites like this, Idea Connection. Um, yeah. um, so in kind of striving to start this project by uh, dealing with patents, something that very, very literally um, governs the uh, kind of material, uh, how to put it, the material production of an immaterial idea. Um, this was what I ended up having to kind of find and sift through. And I think I'm out of time, right? Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that is more or less my conclusion. This is, I mean, I can't go much further into the project um, with this time. I can show you some more images though. Um, so here are some screens that I've made. Oh, yeah, another conclusion. I um, also, as part of this project, um, the restrictions of the patent include the fact that uh, I can make up to 75 derivative objects based on each piece of intellectual property. So in a way, I'm a very small kind of sliver part owner of this um, general kind of immaterial idea. 
that is the least conclusive conclusion ever, but that is my conclusion.